Joe Biden begins his presidency with talks of unity, but also accountability. But what does that look like, particularly when we see the divisions that continue to play out in society, the ones that were on show in the last two weeks and indeed over the last four years? Well, one of the national organizations that's working to bridge some of these divisions is Living Room Conversations. Joining us now to talk about this is Pedro Silva. Thanks for joining us, Pedro. Tell us a little bit about the group and what the work is that you're doing. Well, Living Room Conversations essentially is a platform that enables people to enter into conversation with people with whom they might disagree, but it's like an entry level conversation where there's guides, there's uh, conversation agreements, people usually pair up and then invite two people that they know who would then gather together in a living room or on Zoom or something like that and just talk. And it's not about changing people's minds, but it's about sharing that space, uh, listening and being heard and then allowing the conversation to organically do what it does. And uh, I got involved in it because I was actually trying to create something like that in the com local community because of a lot of issues with race and things that were happening both locally and uh, nationally. And so I started trying to encourage people to have these conversations with their friends and I hosted some things. And then someone from Living Room Conversations said, this is exactly what we do. And because they already had a platform, I decided to I would share that with people rather than try to um, reinvent the wheel, if you will. So give us an example of how it plays out, because they are facilitated conversations. It's not just two people who are maybe on opposite sides of uh, the political spectrum thrown together to hash things out. They're, they're very much moderated or facilitated with a certain set of guidelines and structure. How, how does it actually play out? It's, it's loosely facilitated, though, because the people who choose to participate in them, they are self-facilitated. So the guide itself gives... Uh, people a framework to have those conversations, but there's not an external person that comes in and moderates or anything like that. It's more so two people, generally speaking, who may, let's say they have uh, different perspectives politically and they decide, you know what, rather than argue with you or things like that, let's try to figure out if we can set up a way to sit down have a conversation. There's questions that you go through. And when you when you agree to the conversational agreements, that's a, the accountability. The most you might ask is for someone to be a timekeeper if you have a time crunch. And then each person is invited and encouraged to, as one of the agreements says, own and guide the conversation, which means take responsibility for your role in the conversation. So if you feel that the conversation is going outside of the agreements, then it's up to you to say something. Um, if you feel that someone's doing a soapbox kind of thing and you feel that you're not being able to use your voice, then as a practice, you would say, hi, uh, excuse me, you know, we agreed to not do the soapbox thing. I personally think that's happening. Is there any way we can get back? Um, to the topic, or is there, uh, I'd like to share something. We take responsibility for it because there's a lot of, in my experience, and I don't mean this in a, a, a negative way, but there's a lot of conversational conversational cowardice. So people are really entered to conversations afraid, um, afraid to be, to speak and afraid to hear. And so this kind of gets around that framework by agreeing to some guidelines, agreeing to some questions. And then once you get into that rhythm, I think it starts to uh, evolve and people start to enjoy participating in all the things that make them concerned about talking to someone who may have a different point of view than them uh, starts to dissipate. Now, you said that you first got involved with Living Room Conversations because you were doing work locally in Colorado around race and having discussions around race and as a result of, you know, because of so many of the things that were playing out in society. Mm -hmm. It does seem that a lot of this, the bridge building spaces, the unity spaces that we see being created they often seem to be quite white spaces. I mean, and talk a little bit about your sense of that and how we we need to have full inclusion because it does seem then that there are layers of privilege maybe involved in some of these uh, bridging division spaces where if you're asking people who have a lot more 
at risk to uh, to engage in this type of bridge building that th there's a, a certain level of in inequality and, and privilege there talk a little bit about that well i think there's a lot of factors to play into that first is context so it depends on where you are and where you're having those conversations because if you're in a context where there's more white people than anybody else even if there was a uh, an exact proportion or ratio to the percentage of people in the population, you'll still end up with more white people regardless, because that's just how it is. So contextually, there's that, that situation. So if you take context out of the picture, all things being equal, and just say, um, there's going to be people who want to talk about race or whatever the case may be, then there's some element of privilege in terms of time, for example, if a person's working a job and they happen to be an hourly wage worker and they don't have the space to do it. It's just like a second job to participate in some of these conversations. And some people may have the time and the resources to have them or the technology to have them any other time, you know, they can just schedule in the middle of their day or something like that. So there's those factors as well. But then even if you take that aside, if you think about the incentive of participating in these types of conversations, um, black people, and I'll say black people most especially in this context, but then also, you know, people of color from different groups, um, they may have been talking about this their whole life, you know, talking about being on the receiving end of bias or prejudice, racism, things like that. And they may talk among themselves and there's a little bit of a distrust sometimes to talk with people, uh, certain white people, let's say. So there's going to be a hesitation for some people and that awareness that they may be taking a risk and they may be seen as being contrary or whatever the case may be. So there's that at play as well. Um, but then even if you take that out of the picture as well, let's say you have a person that's of personal color of black, they have all the time in the world, they have the resources, different things like that. Take those aside. Even if you have a person of color, a black person who has the resources and has the time, the other aspect of the incentive piece is that white people have more of an incentive to have what's called civil dialogue because they can, it's safer, it feels safer. You know, so if you get in a conversation with a person of color, let's say all things being equal, there's no uh, no threat that you can have on them financially or socially. They're self they're self sufficient. They don't need your money. They don't need your resources. And now you're having a conversation about race, and you say something that's misinformed, then that person can say something to you. And because there's no, uh, and I'll t explore this concept in a second there's no uh ranking social ranking that puts the person in their place and then all things being equal the white person will be more inclined to leave that conversation with their feelings hurt you know generally speaking because it's hard to really argue with the fact that there's that the country was built on uh racism and slavery and genocide all those things it's, you, you can try to argue it but it's a pointless argument. Everyone really knows it. Even the people who argue it or they say that, you know, it was God's divine intervention or, you know, manifest destiny or something and they were able to take the country. Even people who argue that on some level, they know that they wouldn't want it to happen to them. So they know on a visceral level that it's not a sincere argument. There's no real point to it. You know, they may make it, but they on some level they know would you want the same thing to happen to you no and there's an inherent thing in humans that no matter how resistant they are to justice and equality they know what they would and wouldn't want to happen to them so taking that and leveling the playing field white people have more incentive to have civil discourse and conversations that give them the space to work it out without having to feel the full impact of if they so happen to say something ignorant, let's say, to a person of color who is resourced and that person educates them and says, hey, you know, everything you just said was um, misinformed, ignorant and slightly racist, that person will be like, whoa, hey, I didn't mean it that way. But if there's no container, 
and the person can just say to you, yeah, let me tell you why. And, and especially if there's no friendship there where they feel a need to nurture that person into a more, uh, a greater sense of awareness, then yeah, if I were white, probably I would want to be in spaces where I could work it out and practice and learn with people who've already agreed that they want to be on the learning journey with me so that when I go out into the world, I'll be more equipped to have those kinds of conversations or more equipped um, and capable of not, you know, putting my foot in my mouth because it goes back to that idea of not wanting to be seen as wrong, you know, and or making a mistake. So it, there, there's that as well. But at the end of the day, the way I um, participate in things is if a person showed up, then I give them, I don't say credit, that's not the real word I want to use, but they don't have to show up. You know, people don't have to show up. So even if, if they do, I just meet them there, you know, and I show up as myself, hoping hopefully they show up as themselves and we just talk, you know, and see what happens. And I, I, I sincerely don't try to change people's minds. I just say my perspective, you know, and I invite them to say their perspectives. And if in the course of us having a conversation, something in them changes, then wonderful. And I'm also open to to changing, you know. And so that's that's the only thing you can do if you want to have a, a sincere and authentic uh, dialogue. I've uh, read some notes that you've made, you know, along those lines about how in these conversations people need to really recognize the lived experience of people mm -hmm. who are maybe making themselves vulnerable and sharing their own lived experience and this seems particularly important when it comes to people of color and mm -hmm. i know you've had this experience around say a conversation around mm -hmm. police brutality and your experience as a black man and your perception of the police yeah and i've had conversations across a wide spectrum and I just try to just talk from a lived experience space and I don't say that there's not a place for emotion because there is and if it comes up it comes up I'm more inclined to take my my personal emotions and then take responsibility for them and say that's how I feel that's those are my emotions and I don't necessarily try to make someone feel what I feel because I don't think that they can you know, some sometimes what happens in conversations, and I think it's it's um there's nothing wrong with it, but people aren't prepared for it. Is that when the emotions come up and the rawness comes up, it's really uncomfortable because you really don't know what to do with those feelings if you haven't had those lived experiences. There's emotions that I would share really openly in a conversation with other Black people that I wouldn't openly do with white people, not because I am trying to exclude them from a part of who I am. It's just simply, I don't think it's just I wouldn't speak another language to someone that didn't speak that language. I would just struggle to try to speak to them in the language that they do understand, because speaking them into a language that they don't understand isn't going to do anything. There's no progress is going to get made. I can just sit there and say all the things I have to say. So there's there's a lot that comes up in uh, these types of conversations that we're ill equipped to handle. And then when we deal with that uh, sense of awkwardness and pain and discomfort, people say, I don't want to do it anymore. Not realizing that that coming up is a part of the process. It's a part of the revelation. It's a part of growing, you know, and uh, a lot of people just aren't ready for that. <laughs> We're in a very different place than we were four years ago. And I know living room conversations emerged even prior to the, the, the 2016 election. But where do you see it going and, and how important, uh, as we wrap up now, how important is it that we have these type of spaces in society and in community to have these conversations? I think it's of uh, vital importance. Uh, we just did a sermon uh, for Martin Luther King Sunday, and I was presenting some things and spontaneously came out of me that the conversations that we refuse to have today will become the arguments of our children and the wars of our grandchildren. And I, I just can't, I don't know if anybody ever said it before, but it came out of my mouth and I was like, yeah, I think that's about it. You know, if we can't talk about things that are challenging us and figure out a way to uh, expand ourselves, open ourselves up to difference, uh, 
then our kids are going to have to deal with it. And if our kids don't do a good job of it, then our grandkids are going to deal with it. And they may deal with it in a way that's a lot more destructive. So to some degree, I think when we are brave enough to have a conversation, we're doing a large part for the world that we might not see in our lifetime, but it'll play itself out in our children and our grandchildren if we learn how to do that. Pedro Silva, thank you so much for being with us today. Thanks for having me.